uh, we will go ahead and uh, get our program started. Welcome everyone to our uh, part one of our two part program on the important topic of frontotemporal degeneration or FTD. So you will be hearing us refer to it repeatedly today. Uh, this is a two part series, um, but I just want to say that they are standalone sessions. So if you aren't registered for the second one, you'll get plenty of information here today, but there will be a follow-up session uh, next week, actually. Both sessions will be recorded and you can go back and access either of these programs um, anytime via our webinar library. But today is part one of this two-part series on specifically on the topic of detection and diagnosis. So let me start by just introducing uh, the three of us that you, you see here uh, on screen and then we'll get going. My name is Amy. I am the Director of Education here at Alzheimer's San Diego. Uh, I am joined today by uh, my colleague at Alzheimer's San Diego, Adriana McCollum, who is our Director of uh, Volunteers and Social, excuse me, Social Activities. Sorry, did I get your title right, Adriana? Special programs and volunteers. Thank That's you. A handful. <laughs> Thank you. I mix it up all the time. Uh, <laughs> delighted to, to get to co-present with Adriana uh, again here today. We've been, had the pleasure of doing a few programs together over the years. And Adriana and I are both just super excited to be joined today by Sharon Hall. Let me tell you a little bit about Sharon. Um, I'm actually going to read this because it's extensive uh, and I'm not as familiar with it, so I can't do it right off the top of my head, but Sharon Hall is an FTD advocate, a certified caregiving consultant, and an Eden associate. She is uh, trained by the Association of Frontotemporal Degeneration, the AFTD, who uh, I'll mention a few more times here today as an educator and a support group leader. She serves on numerous de dementia advisory boards and educates the public and professionals on the unique symptoms of FTD and how often it is misdiagnosed as a mental health issue like bipolar, schizophrenia, or depression. Ms. Hall has spoken at numerous conferences and webinars on the topic of FTD. We're so happy to have her here uh, at ours and has had numerous articles published on the subject. We will uh, provide you with references to uh, more information uh, from her uh, at the end of the program. She runs a podcast about FTD and facilitates a bi-weekly caregiver support group via Zoom. Uh, she is also, importantly, the care partner to her husband who has been diagnosed uh, with FTD, the behavioral variant, and lives with her at their home. So thank you, Sharon, so much for being with us here today. It's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to get to benefit from uh, all of your, your personal and professional expertise on this topic. Thank you for having me. We're glad to have you. So let's get going here. Let me just briefly introduce you to Alzheimer's San Diego, if you're not familiar with us, we are a local and independent nonprofit organization that supports people who are affected by any kind of dementia. Um, don't be fooled by the word Alzheimer's in our name. We are here to serve anybody who is impacted by any type of dementia, diagnosed or not, uh, here in San Diego County or care partners uh, who are caring for someone from a distance. Our programs and services are open to all. We're also uh, an important part of our mission is fighting stigma and supporting local research endeavors. We receive funding through the uh, San Diego Imperial Geriatric Education Center. We are part of a program called the GWEP, which is uh, regard, which is a geriatric workforce enhancement program. This is a nationwide initiative to improve the quality of services for older adults uh, throughout the United States. And so we receive funding to be able to provide these programs at no cost to professionals or frankly, anybody, anybody who's in attendance. So as I mentioned, this is a two-part program. The second part uh, will be live uh, next week on April 7th. We will do part two of this program, which will focus on uh, uh, more care and support issues. Today, we're gonna focus specifically on uh, uh, diagnosis and detection. Um, and I also wanna say at the end of the program, we'll be talking through some local resources for more information, some national resources as well. Uh, but of course, we're Alzheimer's San Diego. So we're focusing on uh, resources for people uh, who live here in our county primarily. But I just acknowledge, I know there are many of you who are here from other areas and you are welcome. And most of what we're talking about today applies to folks um, absolutely anywhere. 
So here are our objectives. We only have an hour with you this morning, so we're not gonna be going in deep on uh, what dementia is. Uh, we will sort of assume some basic general knowledge of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if you need more information about Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia aside from FTD, please know that there are ample resources available through Alzheimer's San Diego and many other organizations as well for that. Um, today, we are going to focus specifically on increasing your awareness and your understanding of the issues related to frontotemporal de uh, degeneration, FTD. So we're going to talk about prevalence. We're going to talk about the different types of FTD. It is not one thing. We're going to talk briefly about the genetics of FTD. We'll talk through the common symptoms and behaviors, and then get into this uh, the sticky area of detection, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, lots of misdiagnosis in, in this area, uh, but we will talk about some resources uh, for uh, better, uh, getting better care, getting better uh, detection and diagnosis. So let me just start with a very brief introduction. What exactly is FTD? Uh, it is a range of things. It is not one thing. And interestingly, FTD doesn't even just mean one thing. Uh, the, the, the initials themselves uh, refer to frontotemporal degeneration, or it's sometimes referred to as frontotemporal dementia. So there you go. Um, this means many different things. Um, it is caused by a degeneration of the frontal or the temporal lobes of the brain that you see sort of uh, in, a, in that cross-section graphic uh, on the slide, if you're able to see that. Uh, it is progressive. There is no known treatment or cure, um, as with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. The progression can be anywhere. Uh, similarly to Alzheimer's disease, the progression can have a wide range, two to 20 years. Uh, that's, a, that's a really big spread. Um, the average life expectancy is somewhere around between seven and 13 years after the start of symptoms. We don't even talk about after the time of diagnosis because there's, there's so much variability there. Um, the most common cause of death in people with this particular type of dementia, FTD, is actually pneumonia uh, with sepsis following uh, closely behind. So how is FTD different from Alzheimer's disease? This is a very important uh, it, separation and distinction that we want professionals uh, in, in a variety of settings to understand. It does have a unique pathology. So if you are familiar with what we refer to as the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease, which are caused by uh, two particular types of protein uh, present in the brain, uh, FTD has a different pathology. It is caused by a different type of accumulation of a, a two different types uh, of protein. Um, so the abnormal amounts or forms of the tau type of protein and TDP43, these are two different kinds of proteins that accumulate inside the neurons within the uh, frontal, frontal and temporal uh, lobes of the brain, hence the name. It has a younger onset. Uh, than Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's is far and away the most common type of dementia. And so we tend to kind of lump everybody who gets dementia into the, the, the sort of categories, the characteristics of people who, have, who are living with Alzheimer's disease. There are key differences and, and a really big important one is that FTD tends to affect younger people. The majority of people who are diagnosed uh, are diagnosed between the ages of 45 and 64. Whereas Alzheimer's disease, about 90% of people are diagnosed after the age of 65. So a much younger onset, and this is something that makes it so hard to recognize, detect, and get effective uh, diagnosis because people are younger. Uh, the symptoms are different, and so people don't tend to be thinking, hmm, this might be dementia. So unlike Alzheimer's disease, which tends to start with a, a multitude of symptoms, kind of all kind of start together, FTD is different in that it tends to be, there tends to be just one primary symptom. And so the types of FTD are categorized by the type of symptom. I'll get to that um, here in a moment. Because it is a less common type of dementia, uh, because it is it affects people so differently from Alzheimer's disease, it is even more poorly understood by all of us who work in the dementia support world, but also in the medical community, and certainly in terms of uh, public awareness and knowledge. So for all of those reasons, much harder to diagnose. 
So I'm going to be brief here and just describe the types of FTD uh, just for basic familiarity with the terminology. Um, Adriana, in our next segment of this, of this webinar, is going to describe the various symptoms in more detail. So let's start with, and you see uh, in parentheses the, uh, the abbreviations that are used for each of these types of FTD, lots of ac acronyms and initials in this world. So behavioral variant FTD, referred to BBFTD, is the most common type of FTD, and you will frequently hear it referred to as PICS disease. At least we used to hear that more often. I don't, I don't hear that term as often as I used to, but it's still around, also referred to as PICS. Um, the hallmark symptoms of a behavioral variant of FTD are disinhibition, socially inappropriate behavior, um, apathy or kind of emotional blunting, uh, compulsive or ritualistic behaviors, uh, significant changes to a person's normal eating habits, what they eat and how they eat, executive function deficit, big in many types of FTD, and a lack of insight into what is changing about them. The next type that I want to uh, tell you about is ALS FTD. So ALS frontotemporal spectrum disorder is the, the new terminology for this, this clinical syndrome where a person has both FTD and the neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease uh, uh, called ALS, right? Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. When these two conditions exist in the same person, it's referred to as ALS FTD. A, a spectrum of disorders. So in people with this type of FTD, we see behavioral, personality, uh, language changes. Uh, those are what are typically noticed first. And then the motor symptoms associated with the ALS uh, typically are identified later. The next type CBS, corticobasal syndrome, uh, some of the symptoms resemble those that are seen in people with Parkinson's disease, making this one uh, especially tricky to diagnose. Uh, movement deficits often in people with uh, corticobasal syndrome uh, start on one side of the body. Uh, they're they're, uh, they're uneven, uh, but both sides are eventually affected. Uh, cognitive symptoms might include things like alien limb phenomenon, which Adriana will talk more about. Difficulty with mathematical calculations are common in folks with CVS and uh, various visual spatial deficits. PSP is a progressive supranuclear palsy. Uh, symptoms are also primarily related to movement, and this is actually uh, referred frequently to as atypical Parkinsonism. So lots of overlap and confusion there. Uh, common symptoms in people living with PSP uh, are difficulty moving or aiming their eyes normally. You'll see a uh, sort of a, a fixated, uh, a fixed gaze, sometimes balance problems, difficulty with limb movement, rigidity. Uh, many times there are swallowing and speech problems, as well as a variety of behavioral, emotional, and cognitive symptoms. Uh, and then finally, PPA, this is a, a primary progressive aphasia, a type of FTD that then has multiple subtypes. So I won't, I won't go into a lot of the details here, but in PPA, language problems are initially the only impairment. And this is one that is uh, characterized by that one primary uh, symptom in, with regard to language. The language problems are progressive in people with PPA. Um, so PPA is divided into these three subtypes that you see here. The NFV refers to non-fluent um, agrammatic PPA. SV is semantic variant of PPA. And LV is logopenic variant of uh, PPA. So that just refers to various types of language problems. So this really um, it layers down into, there are many different types of FTD, as you see here, um, again, sort of adding to the complexity of, of identifying it and getting people connected to the right support. So let me just make a brief note on the genetics of FTD. So about half, half of the cases of FTD um, that, we, that we see today are familial uh, versus genetic specifically. So they're familial, meaning that they run in families, but there is not a single known genetic cause or, or explanation for why it's running in those families. But a subset of 
those familiar cases are genetic or hereditary, as we say uh, more colloquially in, in nature, and they occur because a parent has passed down a genetic variant that's associated with FTD um, to their child. So it is inherited through the genetic material. So all of the known genetic forms of FTD are autosomal dominant, meaning that if one parent has an FTD associated variant, the child uh, inherits has a 50% chance of inheriting it. So there are more than a dozen different types of genetic variants that are known to cause FTD. I've just put the three most common of them on the screen for you here. Um, C9 ORF72, progranulin, also called GRN, and microtubule associated protein tau, um, or MAPT. These are the three most common uh, genetic variants that we know um, are associated with uh, hereditary uh, FTD. Genetic testing is, uh, is important. It, 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 by itself, genetic testing isn't used to diagnose FTD, but it is used along with other types of testing and assessment to confirm FTD. So it's, there's a, a tricky difference there. Genetic testing is uh, absolutely uh, critically important for people who are living with FTD and their family members, um, but it isn't used, you don't get a genetic test and say, yes, okay, this is, this is definitely um, what's going on. It's used to sort of fill in the gaps um, to, to help solve the mystery of, what, of what's happening. There are many resources available for free genetic testing in families who are affected by FTD. And in your handouts, I forgot to say that at the beginning, but we are gonna be sending you copies of all of these slides as well as some additional resources. Um, though resources for genetic testing are uh, provided at the end of this program and you will receive them in your handouts. So with that, I am going to uh, turn things over to Adriana, who's going to talk more about, uh, I went through sort of what it is. Adriana is going to talk more about what it looks like. Amy, you can hear me okay? Okay. I've had some microphone problems. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, uh, FTD is near and dear to my heart, working with so many wonderful clients with FTD and their amazing care partners. So I'm just happy to be able to share some information about it. Uh, go ahead. There we go. Um, so as Amy mentioned, uh, the majority of individuals with FTD are young. They're between 45 to 64 years old. 13% uh, are under 50. So um, because of this, many people are still in their physical prime. Uh, FTD can have a very slow onset. Um, as Amy mentioned, it can take up to 20 years. Uh, so some care partners we've talked to say they can trace changes back decades. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later in terms of um, their feelings of guilt, not recognizing the signs. Uh, FTD presents differently than Alzheimer's, as again, Amy mentioned. Um, with al Alzheimer's, we first see short-term memory problems, difficulty with language. Um, and this is because of it affecting uh, the impairment of the frontal and temporal lobes. Um, because of this, we often see changes to personality and behavior. Uh, the three primary areas um, that are affected are movement, language, and behavior. And I'll go into a little more detail about those in the next slides. In the first domain with movement, uh, there's difficulty initiating, controlling, coordinating movement. Um, there's impairment to parts of the brain that may cause symptoms similar to Parkinson's or Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, we often see the inability to use hands or arms despite normal strength. Uh, so this may manifest in uh, difficulty with buttons or small appliances, little, um, you know, little movements they have to make. Um, they may begin moving more slowly with increased falls. Um, this is especially the case when they start experiencing stiffness or rigidity, especially um, in the neck and upper body, uh, which can lead to difficulty swallowing, which obviously is a big safety concern. Uh, they may experience alien limb phenomenon. Um, this is the sensation that an arm or leg is no longer part of the body, accompanied by the inability to control the limb. And uh, individuals may also experience paralysis, especially of the face and facial expressions, um, as Amy mentioned, the fixed stare, and uh, many will often have downturned eyes. Next section, a language. Um, so with um, the impairment to uh, their language, you may hear slowed or slurred speech, um, incorrect speech sounds. This is caused by difficulty moving, coordinating the muscles that control the lips, tongue, and jaw. 
Um, those with primary progressive aphasia, and aphasia meaning difficulty using or understanding words, um, they may have impaired word recall, retrieval, or usage, as well as comprehension. Uh, so Amy hit on those um, three different types, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about them. Uh, one is losing the ability to understand words and recognize uh, faces and objects. Um, this causes difficulty with reading and writing. The second type is trouble finding the right words during conversation, but they can still understand words and sentences. The third type is the person has increased difficulty speaking and may omit words that link verbs and nouns, like to, from, the, eventually leading to a mutism or the inability to speak. Okay, and on to behavior, this is a very big list. Um, I'm sure you can imagine just by looking at it, the kind of um, stress and um, challenge that care partners have when, they ha when they're dealing with the behavioral, uh, behavioral variants. Um, so um, we'll go into, this is where most of my time will be um, used up. Uh, um, this inhibition, um, this is very common with FTD. Um, this is because of the um, effects to the part of the brain that controls inhibition. They may do or say inappropriate things, um, such as call someone fat, uh, try to kiss a stranger. Um, they also may have a la um, apathy, which is a lack uh, of interest in previously meaningful activities or self-care. It's a common early symptom. So they might have been an avid golfer, stamp collector, um, someone who made jewelry, uh, they are just no longer interested in those activities. Uh, emotional blunting, um, lack of empathy. So they've lost the interest in the emotions of other people. Um, this is especially difficult for care partners, uh, especially because they may not know what's going on. It, um, uh, it could take years to learn that there's a disease process happening. The care partners may feel like their loved one no longer cares about them. Um, so this can lead to um, a lot of challenges in the marriage. Um, the individual may also um, be gregarious, um, so they may be losing the ability to hold up a conversation, but they can, they're still highly verbal, so they may do a lot of um, telling stories, uh, doing show and tell. This has been uh, very common on our volunteer visits where the individual, individuals will haul out photographs or things they've made or book their favorite books and just talk about them, and they're uh, very entertaining. Uh, it's been, uh, the volunteers have always really enjoyed the visits um, when they get to learn so much about the individual, but um, there's a certain lack of ability to have a two-sided conversation. Another thing that shows up, especially early in the disease, is uh, compulsive ritualistic behaviors, uh, such as tapping, clapping, smacking lips, which can probably drive uh, some care partners up the wall um, and um, you know, can lead to many fights, I, I imagine. Um, eating habits also will change. Um, they can become obsessive about eating, um, often fixated on sweets. We, um, there was one volunteer who didn't um, manage a, a visit very well and let his, uh, the client eat nine ice cream bars while he was there. Um, so this is something that um, I've heard of care partners, you know, locking up their refrigerator and locking up um, the cabinets and hiding food. Um, they can really become obsessive about, about food. Executive functioning is um, impaired. This is planning, decision-making, problem-solving. Again, this is due to the impairment in the frontal lobes where that kind of, um, where that is managed. Um, this disease can also cause mental rigidity and inflexibility, which is the, um, so that is the inability to adapt to new situations or see from others' point of view so that people can become um, seemingly very stubborn or just un unable to understand where their care partner is coming from. Um, again, leading to those, um, those challenges in a marriage or a close relationship. Um, another one that, um, again, especially with the behavioral, behavioral variant is aggression. Um, I, this can often stem from um, the inability to handle frustrations or an intense focus on something. And um, because the individuals often can be young and strong, and especially in a residential care setting, this can be especially challenging to manage. Um, so impulsivity, criminal behavior, um, you know, obviously very, could be very alarming. This stems from disinhibition and impairment to executive function. So this could be um, something like exposing um, himself to children, urinating in public, or um, sexually harassing other individuals. 
Um, studies show that 40% of those with a behavioral variant have committed a crime. And it's es estimated that 20% of the prison population has undiagnosed or misdiagnosed FTD, which is uh, shocking. Challenges with instrumental activities of daily living. Um, so all the symptoms we've talked about combine to make those IADLs very difficult. Um, it causes impairment to planning, problem solving, and um, just general lack of insight. Um, it's more common with FTD than with Alzheimer's disease, um, inability to have awareness of what's going on and then um, you know, experiencing again the, those behaviors which make it that much more difficult to, to manage. Okay, the next slide. Um, so the impact on families and care partners is such a difficult disease to manage. Um, so when you have health, youth, physical strength, it not only means the care partners begin losing someone at an early age, um, the person with FTD may be stronger than the care partner. So managing those issues can be really challenging. If you combine that with movement and language symptoms, um, and especially managing them at home, um, just adds to that stress and the, the challenge. And then along with the functional changes with um, ADL, such as toileting or personal care, and IEDL, such as managing medication, paying bills, care partners are left, one, very confused, um, especially when they don't know that there is a disease process occurring. So you can go to the next one, please. Um, so there's confusion because they may not know what's, what's going on. All of a sudden, their person is behaving very differently. Um, this can lead to a lot of trauma, and, that, and that's a word I've heard a lot from care partners. Um, uh, others not understanding, they don't understand themselves, they're having a difficulty um, getting an answer, um, they're being misled in terms of what might be going on, thinking it might be a marital issue, um, the, the, and their loved one not seeming to care about them anymore. It can lead to a lot of isolation as well. Um, just feeling like they have no one to talk to, no one who understands what their experience is. Obviously, financial problems can come into play. Um, the person with FTD may inappropriately spend money, such as you know, buying a car, collectibles. It's also very expensive to diagnose um, and expensive to pay for long-term care. So it really hits from many different areas um, in terms of being able to care for the person, not to mention the care partner um, because of a younger onset diagnosis may be young and working um, his or herself and may be needing to, um, to go to part-time or full-time care of, of their loved one. Um, all of this can cause uh, depression, anxiety, um, PTSD, which um, may not be treated. Um, you know, they may be spending so much time trying to get their their loved one, their person um, diagnosed and managed, they don't have time to care for themselves. And then um, the guilt is a really big one. And I hear this one a lot with the care partners I work with that um, looking back on the years of, um, you know, marital discord or relationship problems that really stem from FTD, but they weren't aware of it. And so um, thinking back, oh, if I'd known then what I know now, I would have behaved differently. I would have been more compassionate. I would have been more understanding. And so the guilt is a really big part. It's, it's a, it's a um, big challenge for care partners to, to reckon with. Okay, move on to the next one. So I'm going to, um, I just provide an overview of the common symptoms and features of FTD, um, which um, as I mentioned, fall into three domains, movement, language, and behavior. And now I'm gonna hand it over to our uh, wonderful Sharon Hall, uh, who will talk about the challenges of detection, diagnosis, and treatment. Thank you, Adriana. So you can uh, move on to the next there. We're gonna, the challenges of detection are really, really difficult. Uh, the symptoms can appear years before a diagnosis and they, they creep up slowly. And so you really don't get your arms around what's really happening because at the age that this presents, sometimes as young as your twenties, no one is thinking that it has anything to do with dementia. And it certainly doesn't act like a brain tumor, although you begin to wonder if that's what it was, but oftentimes they're perceived as marital problems and that can go for a very long time. And also um, another thing that is 
very often described as midlife crisis, which by the way, is not a diagnosis of any type, just as uh, dementia is not a disease. It is a series of symptoms. So midlife crisis really doesn't exist, but we've had a way of describing the way that people act in midlife, where they may be getting close to retirement and they're getting antsy or uh, their eyes are wandering in other directions that they shouldn't or things like that are sort of dubbed midlife crisis. And there's other personal issues. Oftentimes, because of the disinhibition, oftentimes people with FTD in the early stages where you don't even know what's happening, but you know something's going on, uh, they may have affairs. Uh, my husband was sexting. It was the most traumatic thing I had ever experienced in my whole life. I never expected anything like that from him. And uh, that was sort of the the culminating blow to know that something was definitely wrong. But even though his mother had Pick's disease, uh, and the reason that Pick's and FTD, uh, that you use the two terms sometimes interchangeably, Pick bodies in the brain uh, can cause behavioral variant FTD. So the the, uh, the PICS has sort of dropped off the the radar and has become more behavior variant FTD. But uh, personal issues come up. And oftentimes the education, uh, not the education, the um, your, your employment oftentimes becomes a huge, huge problem. There's also age bias and stigma. People just don't realize that someone that's 30 or 40 looks healthy, they're strong, that oftentimes, especially in early stages, the language is not impaired at all, except in PPA when that's the first symptom, but in behavior variant, oftentimes you don't, uh, you don't have that. And so this person looks absolutely normal. And so people just, have a stigma against that. They think that they're just being a big fat jerk, including those of us who live with them. That's probably the first thing that I thought was that my husband is a big fat jerk. He turned into a jerk. So there's an age bias because of their age and their abilities and that stigma of of the fact that they look so healthy and how could they possibly have dementia? Because when we say the word dementia, we think of someone older, we think of someone drastically impaired, it's just where our mind goes. Uh, So can you uh, go to the next, please? Misdiagnosis is so common. So let's say we say, okay, something's drastically wrong here. Something's going wrong. So usually the place where we start, because we know something is going on, we usually start with our primary care physician explaining these things to them and telling them what is happening. And we get various signs and of what's going on <laughs> because alzheimer's as uh, amy indicated is such an elephant in the room and such a big everyone knows alzheimer's it seems and that usually will be where a primary physician will go first and the reason for that is because primary care physicians will see zero to two ftd people in their entire career. So they're going for what they know. And Alzheimer's disease oftentimes will be one of the things that they go for and put people on medications for Alzheimer's, which absolutely do nothing for FTD and and sometimes make it much worse. Depression is another one we hear. So a primary care physician might say, here comes the midlife crisis. They're depressed. You know, maybe they're not where they thought they would be at their age or their status or whatever. Uh, So the depression comes out and that's another one that may be treated by a primary care physician without even realizing that it could be something else. Parkinson's disease also will be looked upon as it may be uh, because we oftentimes have tremors. My husband, his leg is up and down all constantly, 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 constantly. And that's we talked about before. I talked about the clapping or the smacking of the lips or things like that. Those things that are repetitive and movements type of things often are looked at as Parkinson's disease. 
Schizophrenia is another. We have people that have been diagnosed, many people that have been diagnosed with schizophrenia and are put on antipsychotics used for schizophrenia, much to the detriment of them because they do not have schizophrenia. So basically they're taking medication that is not good for them. It is against what they should be taking. The other one in the, in the psychological community that between schizophrenia, the other is bipolar disorder. So when you're looking at psychology, when you get referred for marital issues, because obviously you're, you've been in a relationship, not when you're in the twenties, but certainly more towards your mid thirties, mid forties to fifties, it probably is a fairly long-term relationship. And so they think because things are changing, it's a marital issue. So you are referred for psychological issues. You're referred to a counselor and marital problems come up. And that's those are the people that usually will peg you with the depression, the schizophrenia or the bipolar because that's their realm. That's what they understand. So obviously this is difficult to diagnose and misdiagnosis is common. And, and like I said, primary care physicians see zero to two in their entire career. I personally believe, and this is just my personal opinion, that psychologists, marital counselors, they see many more people with FTD than even a primary physician, because sometimes you go right to marital issues and you go right to a counselor when these things start occurring because you think something is definitely wrong. Next. There's a lot of consequences in misdiagnosing. Uh, healthcare providers, law enforcement frequently are untrained and inexperienced with FTD that can be a huge issue. For the healthcare providers, you're looking at putting people on the wrong medications, putting them on medications they shouldn't be on. Law enforcement is untrained and inexperienced, so they may be called and they look at it as a domestic issue. When someone is diagnosed with FTD, we usually tell people that they should have their paperwork with them. We always tell them to go to an elder law attorney first thing and get all your paperwork in order, become the power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney for that person. But when they get aggressive and sometimes quite aggressive. We always say your safety is so much more important than anything else. You need to leave the house, take your paperwork with you, call 911, explain that they have a dementia and have your paperwork with you. When, when they come, they'll go in the house and they see this perfectly able to speak, uh, a strong person who looks like absolutely nothing is wrong with them. And they've probably calmed down during the time it took for them to get there. We have actually had people, we have had law enforcement come to a scene where a wife will be outside. The husband has been raging inside and been aggressive towards her, sometimes physically aggressive. And they will actually have the wife leave the home and think that the person is just fine to be left there alone. And this happens more than we would like to see it happen. Uh, that's why educating law enforcement, first responders, even emergency medical uh, people need to be trained much more. Another consequence can be that impulsivity. They can go towards addiction, whether that be uh, alcoholism or go into drugs. They can have criminal behavior, gambling, prostitution. This affects men and women almost equally. Uh, Dr. Bruce Miller at UCSF says it's about a 60-40, 60% men and 40% women. So it's much closer than even Alzheimer's. You know, Alzheimer's seems to be overwhelmingly women. So this is much more even. So where prostitution is concerned, it can be someone soliciting prostitution or someone becoming a prostitute. They become very hypersexual and they can have substance abuse and violence and violence can be very disruptive. It can come on very quickly when people with FTD sort of lose it. It, it comes on like this. And my husband will describe it as I know it's coming and I can't 
stop it. He has not been physically violent to me, but he certainly has been verbally, uh, verbally uh, in, in public. He's been ver very verbal at some times, very impatient. And so he becomes very verbal, but it comes on very quickly. Their disinhibited behavior causes fear. People fear them because they, all of a sudden this person is like, speaking dirty to them. They're telling them all kinds of dirty jokes, perhaps showing them pictures from the internet that they have found. And people are kind of back off of that. You lose friends and family really easily when FDD comes into your life. Uh, it causes discomfort with people and confusion for families and caregivers. Uh, a care partner doesn't know what's going on. I didn't know what was going on. I thought my husband was a jerk. I, I thought, okay, this is it. I'm not taking this and we're going to get divorced. And we were probably within two months of my absolutely leaving him when I saw a video by AFTD called It Is What It Is and realized that this is what his mother had. His mother had Pick's disease, was diagnosed way back in the 80s and 90s, early 90s. And uh, so I had no idea that behavior was involved because it was very hushed, hushed. Uh, no one talked about that disinhibition or, or some of the things that happen in, in their household. So it causes a lot of confusion and families that don't live 24 seven with someone with FTD have no idea uh, what's going on and can blame the spouse. They'll say, it's all your fault. They weren't like this until you got married. Uh, so that, that causes a lot of, a lot of difficulty in the, uh, in the, in the, in the families. Next. Getting an accurate diagnosis. This is difficult because primary care physicians do not see many and people in, in psychology and, and those types of uh, things that they do there, uh, they, they just don't know anything about FTD. They're not looking for that. They're looking for the marital issues or the depression or the bipolar. Bipolar onset at 40 is just about unheard of. That's, that's not when it happens. It does take an average of 3.6 years, almost four years to get a diagnosis. And this is after you go, something's wrong. So we're already actively seeking answers and it still takes four years. You have to be pretty persistent to, to make people understand that this is not the person they were. I always say when someone is not who they were, think neurological, not psychological, at least eliminate neurological before pursuing psychological. And the setting where you receive a diagnosis is very important. Usually your teaching hospitals will have a dementia specialist uh, who should know FTT, large medical centers, research institutions are very good at, uh, at at getting to a diagnosis. And a diagnosis is clinical. Uh, they cannot say you definitively have FTD until autopsy uh, because it is a clinical diagnosis. We do not at this time have biomarkers. So we can't do a blood test and say, oh, you have high cholesterol. We can't do a blood test and say, oh, you have FTD. So there are no biomarkers to definitively do this. That's why it takes an expert because they put together what the family or the spouse, the person that sees the person most is telling them about how they have changed along with a neuropsych test, which can distinguish executive dysfunction and uh, that blunting where people, they don't understand the, the uh, emotions of another person. So those all go together to make a clinical diagnosis. And that's usually where that happens. Unfortunately, because FTD is very, oh, they call it rare, I don't think it's as rare as they think it is, uh, but we get what we call diagnosed and adios. So here's what we hear. We go to that. We finally get to a center four years after this has started. We're pulling our hair out. We don't know what's going on. We finally get to somebody that we think is going to be able to tell us what's happening. And this is what we hear. 
I'm sorry, you have frontotemporal, sometimes dementia, what it, degeneration, depends on what that doctor calls it. There's no treatment. We'll try to treat the symptoms. There's no cure. We suggest that you get your affairs in order. And since there aren't any treatments, we'll just try to treat the symptoms. So we'll see how it goes and we'll see you in six months. We call that diagnose and adios. So we are not given information. We get hit with this word that we've never heard of before. We don't know anybody that's had this. Somehow dementia is involved in it, but we have no idea what that means. And here they are just going, see you in six months. Ah, is diagnosed and adios. It's horrible on, on spouses. And I'm sure any of you that are in this world know what it's like. And oddly, oddly, you know, it's not just FTD. Oftentimes, all dementia gets that diagnosis and adios. Uh, people just assume that you know what that is, and we don't. Next, please. Medications. As I said before, a primary care will go to the Alzheimer's route, and they'll do the Aricept, Exelon, all those things that are not recommended for FTD, not only are they contraindicated, they're correctly, uh, incorrectly diagnosed, they're given incorrectly, and it sometimes can exacerbate some of the symptoms that are, that are present. And if you don't use the medications correctly, you can end up with a beast on your hands. Uh, some of the things that are given to people that have FTD that are thought to have another diagnosis can make them much worse. Also antidepressants and antipsychotics. Uh, antidepressants are usually the first thing that is given when you have an FTD diagnosis. And it's not because they're depressed necessarily. It's because it usually will sort of tamp down some of that behavior initially. Uh, sometimes antipsychotics need to be given usually in a very small dose, and that's to be able to keep a person within the home or even within a memory care facility. You don't want somebody to be completely knocked out and sleeping the entire day because they're on something that just puts them out. But you do need to tamp down some of those behaviors that are aggressive or, or disinhibited uh, that really needs to be a little bit tamped down in order for you to keep your person at home and keep you and them safe. I have two rules in our household. My job is to keep my husband safe, but to keep me sane. So in order to do that, sometimes we have to add things that you may think of as, oh, you should never give these to, to people, but they can't, sometimes they're in very small doses just to kind of tamp things down to make them part of society. We just can't be running around punching people or saying nasty things to them all the time. Next. Understanding of TD, prevalence in the, oh, no, we're going to go to uh, Adriana, right? We're pausing for some questions here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, terrific information. Uh, I just sitting here have learned a few new things here this morning already. We do have a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to uh, point this first one to you, Sharon. Uh, there is a question, is FTD, you mentioned some of the, the most common conditions that FTD can be misdiagnosed as. Is LBD, Lewy body dementia, is that one of those? Uh, is it sometimes difficult to distinguish uh, frontotemporal dementia from Lewy body dementia because of the movement symptoms that we also see in LBD? Do you see that in, your, in the folks that you support? Usually Lewy body is not the first thing they will go to because in Lewy body, one of the prominent things besides the Parkinson uh, issue, I mean, Lewy body and Parkinson's are directly connected. Uh, and because of that, usually the Parkinsonism in FTD doesn't come on until later. Uh, but in Lewy body, it's the REM sleep disorder that usually will uh, pop up as being unusual where people are acting out their dreams. 
that can happen with FTD as well. There have been times when I've looked at my husband and said, does he have Lewy body or does he have FTD? <laughs> because he has in the past acted out dreams. So, uh, but usually that sort of distinguishes, especially from a professional in a teaching center can usually separate the two. Great. Thank you. That, that, that last point there is a, a really, a really important one. And I'm, I want to kind of emphasize that in our answer to this next question as well. Uh, somebody writes, my husband is diagnosed with non-fluent variant PPA and PSP. I was diagnosed in 2021 and is 76 years old. So it seems to this person that this is dramatically out of the average age range, uh, 76 years old, does this happen? Uh, should this person be concerned that he's been misdiagnosed because of that later age? Uh, his symptoms as described here definitely fall in line with the language aspect, although many symptoms line up in the behavior column, mostly passive aggressive types of behaviors. Now, I know that Sharon, despite your many years of experience, you're not gonna try to make a diagnosis right here in this webinar. <laughs> and that what we would generally point uh, this person toward is um, a, a research institution. Uh, if you are concerned that there may be misdiagnosis, we will share some resources for that in a, in a few minutes. Um, any other advice you would give here? Yes, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy is, very much like a uh, behavior variant in the behaviors. I have a good friend whose mother had progressive supranuclear palsy and it's very much in the behavior category. So they can exhibit those behaviors. And uh, the, but the aphasia, if, if that's a first symptom, usually that's why they point towards a primary progressive aphasia. As far as the age is concerned, FTD can be diagnosed between 20 and 80. So you're right in there. Uh, okay. So, so those FTD, young ages are just the most common, most uh, cluster, common but is okay. below. It mm -hmm. is the most common dementia under the age of 60, but that doesn't mean it's not diagnosed later in life. And I see more okay. and more of that happening. Okay. Thank you. Interesting question here uh, in the q and I understand dementia to be a global or diffuse deterioration, yet FTD sounds like it's more localized uh, in these two regions of the brain. Why isn't it called frontotemporal disease rather than degeneration or uh, dementia? Is that because it eventually progresses into more diffuse patterns? Um, my guess at this, uh, and please confirm uh, if, if you've got a better answer, but my best guess is that the word dementia and degeneration is used basically because FTD doesn't refer to one specific thing. Uh, so uh, we, we don't use the word disease because FTD isn't a specific disease. Uh, any, is, that, is that correct? Any clarification you can add there? It's a neurodegenerative disorder. So your, your brain is degenerating and it does progress. My husband's behavior started out as absolute behaviors. He now is having difficulty with language. He now walks with a rollator, so he has mobility issues. So things, and memory, he, his short-term memory is getting uh, less than to be desired, uh, but his long-term, I, I rely on him for long-term memory. I mean, his long-term is fantastic, but short term is going. So it progresses, your brain literally shrinks so that it will affect other areas. Okay, thank you, that helps. Um, Adriana, there was a question that was asked about the percentage of the population that is undiagnosed, um, it, it, the general population versus um, the imprisoned population with, can you? Clarify I that. was just I was just gonna um, hand that one back to Sharon. I think she would have that more readily available than I would. Do we have that data? Uh, sort of. I, I mean, you you alluded to uh, we, there's probably much more than we think. Yes. Um, is there wh what kind of data is out there? There's between they say that between ten and fifteen percent of all dementias are FTD. Uh, I personally think that's probably bigger than that. And, and you, I don't know if it's just because I'm in this world that I see more and more and more uh, diagnosing. And I, 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 
I get calls much more frequently about someone being di diagnosed with FTD than when I was first involved in this back seven years ago. So, yeah. uh, you know, I think, I think it's, I think it, the rate of diagnosis is picking up. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have time for one final question. This is a really good one here. Uh, my dad was officially diagnosed uh, last July. I don't know what variant he has. We're taking him uh, to a clinic, a Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale for a second opinion uh, for his peace of mind. Uh, what do you think we should do to make the best use of the time with the doctor? Um, first, is there any information, is there any kind of a checklist or any kind of resource that you're aware of uh, on the AFTD website or anywhere else that you're aware of? Um, I'll start there. Uh, and secondly, any, any general advice on how to make the most of the limited time that you get in front of a doctor? The thing that I always say to people is write it down, write it down, what's happening. How is this different than what they were? That's what's yeah. important. So, you know, you, you could be a jerk from the from beginning of time. I mean, you could be a, a 15 year old jerk you know, <laughs> and you're a jerk for the rest of your life. But if this person never had the, these types of behaviors and they're suddenly exhibiting them, write it down. So if it's someone who never told a dirty joke, we have ministers who suddenly start telling dirty jokes to the congregation. Uh, so that is not a normal behavior. So you write down these things that have changed. Make sure you let the doctor know what has changed. If this is a person who was very fluent in their speech, perhaps gay, you know, were involved in meetings every day, never had an issue and suddenly can't find all the words or misnames things. Or if there's someone, like I said, if they if their behavior starts changing, write it down. That's what's important. When somebody is not who they were, think neurological, not psychological. So write down all those things that they were not before. Right. That I love that um, that guidance. It's really it's it's really clarifying and I really appreciate it a lot. Um, the, the difference in, in who, who somebody was and, and who they are today. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to just wrap things up here. Before we do, I want to just make sure everyone's aware of these resources that are going to be emailed out uh, to everyone here shortly. Here is the website of the Association for Frontotemporal Dementia Degeneration that we have been referring to, the AFTD.org, uh, the It Is What It Is video that Sharon referenced earlier. There's also great information about FTD available through these uh, credible uh, sites, the National Institute on Aging and the Mayo Clinic have uh, wonderful information. Uh, Talking FTD is Sharon's podcast. You can find it at that link. A great uh, catalog of episodes is available there. And a resource that she turned us on to that has just been a wealth of great information is the UC San Francisco uh, Weill Institute for Neurosciences. Tons of great information and resources there on that website. Um, here is Sharon's blog, Understanding Dementia Care Needs. And uh, for professionals here in the room with us today, the APA has a really terrific three-part CE program that you can access uh, at the APA website called Young Onset Dementia, What Professionals Need to Know. Um, here, for those of you that are supporting people living in San Diego County, uh, the two diagnostic clinics uh, that we would uh, direct you to if you're seeking clarity about a diagnosis or uh, additional information resources. UC San Diego uh, has the Brain Health and Memory Disorders Clinic and the Kaizen Brain Center. Those are two, two local uh, terrific uh, research centers. Information about genetic testing and research, which I alluded to earlier. Um, the all FTD biofluid and longitudinal studies have a site here in San Diego through UCSD. Uh, you're in your email, you're actually going to get a flyer with more information about this, uh, these two specific opportunities um, through, uh, at, and you can get details uh, at allftd.org. Um, so we're, we're very grateful to have that research study happening here at UC San Diego. Uh, you can also get information about uh, genetic testing and research at the FTD Disorders Registry, Invitae, I hope I'm saying that correctly, and uh, a great uh, website called Prevention Genetics. 
uh, for support. Uh, we hope that you uh, know that Alzheimer's San Diego is here. I'll tell you more about us in a moment here, as well as a, another nonprofit organization called for, the For Their Thoughts Foundation. It's actually headquartered here in San Diego County, but supports people, uh, affect caregivers of people with FTD around the country. They offer um, respite grants to, and, and support to caregivers, a really wonderful organization that, again, uh, you will get a, a handout about that organization organization in the emailed uh, materials that are going to go out later today. So here we are. This is Alzheimer's San Diego in a quick nutshell. Everything that we do is provided at no cost to the families that we serve. We are able to provide a, a huge array of free support and services information, uh, direct clinical support through our team of dementia experts, support groups, um, volunteer services, respite, telephone check-in calls, uh, access or connection to local research opportunities, and much, much more. Uh, all free because of the support of our community. We're very grateful for that. So please visit our website, call us, uh, ask questions. If you need resources, uh, we are here to help. The second part of this program is going to focus more on uh, the, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, Part two will focus more on care and support. So we'll dive more into the supportive resources that are specifically helpful uh, with regard to FTD, the people that are affected by it, living with the symptoms as well as their care partners. We'll talk more about that next time. So we are gonna close the webinar here. We're at our time. When it ends, you'll be re redirected to a quick survey. It's anonymous and we would really appreciate your feedback. And a reminder again, we'll send the slides out to you shortly here today. And within a couple of days, we'll have a recording of this webinar uh, available up on the Alzheimer's San Diego professional education page. I will include a link to that page in the email for everyone. So you can, you can check back and a recording of, of part two will be available there in another week or so as well. I would so like to thank it. you for, for taking this on. Uh, I'm very grateful to you and the FTD community is very grateful to you for doing this and uh, making people understand how different FTD is. Terrific. Well, we, we really, we couldn't have done it without you, Sharon. You were so, so helpful to us in putting this program together and just your, your sharing of your personal experiences as well as this technical knowledge is it's just invaluable. We're so grateful to have you with us here today. We look forward to next week's session uh, with you as well. So thank you. Okay, with that, I will, uh, I'll wrap things up. We wish you all a, a great day and we hope to see many of you next week.